Hello and a very warm welcome to the Lizelle Wellbeing Show and I'm very excited to share with you this latest chat that I've had with Ollie Hunter, a chef and author on a quest towards a green revolution. And Ollie first came to the public eye as a semi-finalist in the 2013 series of MasterChef and he has certainly been very busy ever since. These days, he and his wife run the Wheat Sheaf Pub in Wiltshire, which has been voted the UK's most sustainable pub in Britain. He's also the author of two books, the latest of which is called Join the Greener Revolution, 30 Easy Ways to Live and Work Sustainably, and it is out now. His two books offer refreshing ideas on how we can make our homes and lifestyles less damaging, Some of the ideas are extremely simple and others, well, they're perhaps a greater leap into sustainability. Ollie writes for the Sustainable Restaurant Association too and his articles can often be found in national newspapers, spreading his message far and wide. And his current project, 30 Food, is looking to change the way we source our ingredients and use more readily the abundance of local suppliers and seasonality. We had such a great chat. I do hope that it will encourage all of us to make the small changes in our homes that can make a big change to our environment. And don't forget that if you'd like to watch our chat today, the video podcast is available on YouTube. And as always, I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts and having more discussions on Instagram after the show. So without any further ado, let's hear it from Ollie. So Ollie, a very warm welcome. It's great to be able to chat to you. I'm an admirer of all your work. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for having me on your show and on your podcast. Yeah, it's a It's a pleasure. And I'm very pleased to hear that your ideas are easy ways to live and work sustainably, because it's not always easy, is it? No, no, it's not. But, you know, I'm just quite bored of the uh, the sort of the the scaremongering and the, Mm -hmm. um, you know, the sort of negativity about it. Because for me, sustainability is a really is a positive and it's a joyful revolution movement. And um, so I think that that, that, that the easy ways, because habit which is you know created after 21 days whatever you want to call it you know it becomes easy once you get into it yeah absolutely and what inspired you what was your journey that led you to this it has been a long journey probably ever since i watched uh blue planet david Attenborough's blue planet 12 13 years ago um but i've always been you know in love with nature in love with food and just Mm -hmm. everything to do with that um and it's been an amazing long journey with food and drink and I set up an organic wine company and I've worked in bars Great. and restaurants all around London and set up a street food company in, in Brixton so then I was on MasterChef um, and then uh, you know, yeah. the pub and the pub's really sort of cemented that whole sustainable yeah. journey for me. Fantastic and one of the things that I'm really keen to talk about which I know is a real passion of yours is this war on waste yeah, totally. because so much of our society is disposable and wasted. And I know that certainly working in the restaurant trade, huge amounts of waste, aren't there? I mean, there's just the food waste is, can be colossal. It is uh, probably one of the biggest issues. I think we've probably all heard some facts, you know, I think about um, just food waste being such a huge, and uh, yeah, well, all sorts of waste being such a huge part of the CO2 emissions to global warming. Um, but I sort of, you know, waste is such a great concept, or well, zero waste is such a great concept, and I don't really see it as 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 a, as a challenge, but more as an opportunity, sort of, to relish in it. Um, mm. I call them byproducts now. I don't really call it waste anymore because in nature there is no waste. Everything turns into something else, you know. And we have these decomposers which magically turn, you know, leaves into soil, like worms and, and snails and slugs. So I think I see everything as a byproduct, and I try to create as much flavour from these byproducts as possible so how does that translate then into your restaurant work in your pub are you are you serving things based on waste yeah very much so 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 what 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 we would normally call waste i mean obviously byproducts rather we should probably rename them yeah byproducts yeah i mean so let's let's coin that now um so i mean there are examples in the book like um sweet corn cob ice cream so uh Mm. you, you you take off the kernels of the cob and use the kernel somewhere else in a delicious dish, whatever you want. But then you've got this cob. And for me, flavour is part of the whole vegetable, the whole, you know, fish, and whatever it is that you're eating. Um, So we roast off the cobs, uh, and then we simmer it in milk and cream. 
and make it into an ice cream like your normal way with eggs and sugar. Um, How amazing! Freeze it, and then it has this amazing like creme brulee, vanilla-like taste. So it's it's cool because we sort of created that vanilla flavor, but from a byproduct grown in England. Yeah, that is astonishing, isn't it? Do you grow your own food as well? Yeah, we do try and grow as as much as we can. You know, I mean, it's a full time job. You know, that's why we have amazing sure. farmers who do their do their work. But um, I really try and focus on perennial uh, produce because they come back year on year, and I don't have to worry about that too much. Mm. <laughs> it's an easy go. You mentioned. Trip. <laughs> you mentioned zero waste as a concept. I mean, do you think that is achievable? Do you think as a, as a, as a planet, we can actually get around to having zero waste? I mean, wow, it's, it's such a um, simple concept in itself, isn't it, to have zero waste? And I love the ideology of it. You know, you've got people like Dougie McMaster in Silo who's doing that. Um, and there's a guy called Jost Bakker in Australia who's creating the things called Future Food Systems. He's creating these buildings which are designed to have absolutely zero waste, and it's it's phenomenal. So he's really leading the vision on something like that. I think it is possible, but I think we've got a bit of you know way to get there. Um, yeah. uh, but in the meantime, I think there is so much we can energy we can save from the process. I mean, this this concept of zero waste, I see the world as energy. This sort of like energy mm-hmm. equation of ins and outs. So if I get X amounts of energy in. If I throw that sweet corn cob away, that's energy out that I'm not using. So I'm trying to use as much energy as possible. And that's how nature works. It's just that energy of yeah. energy. Yeah. And I think a lot of uh, looking more sustainably, you know, generally has to really focus on being a bit more local. And I know that you're a great proponent of, of working collaboratively with local communities and local producers around you how do you think we can all perhaps turn our attention more locally what could we do that would really help reduce the amount of waste by by focusing on what's around us locally so one of my real like, loves about the world really is organic local vegetables i just think they are um uh, the saving grace in so many dishes i sort of have this analogy that uh, it's a bit like david bowie versus boyzone or one direction or something like that it's just that <laughs> David Bowie's got this wonderful, complex song that's just beautiful, and you know, the whole thing's thought about. And whereas Boyzone has just got this chorus, and it's pretty, you know, okay, but it does the job sort of thing. And it's a bit like just serving meat without good vegetables. The good vegetables yeah. are the foundations and the complexity around the chorus that make that whole song, the whole dish, just absolutely amazing. So mm. for me, um, they heighten, and especially with local produce, because freshness for me, freshness equals flavour. It has more energy, Mm -hmm. it has more nutrition, it has more energy, um, more deliciousness, that uh, the the freshness will equal flavour. So so when you're looking to buy vegetables, I really sort of of tell people or think that people should sort of look for good organic local box skins. You know, the Mm -hmm. national ones are great, but I think really the localness adds such a depth of flavour and freshness that it will transform your whole dish, really. Yeah, I became aware of an organisation not that long ago called Big Barn, and they connect people with local producers, and you just get emails every so often about local people that have suddenly got something that is seasonal and available and close to you. And it's just such a great network that we can tap into really easily. I think that's the key, isn't it, is making it really easy and available for people. Absolutely. We all live, you know, hard lives, consuming lives in that sense of just trying to do as much as possible be a good employee, good employer, be a good friend, be, you know, all these sort of things. So the easier we can make this, the better our, you know, the easier it fits into our lives as well, the better it will. Sure. How does this then tie into fostering a kind of a circular economy, which is something that you talk about in your book? Um, so circular economy is, again, if you look at sort of that whole byproduct waste analogy, it's, it's zero waste, um, where every bit of, I guess you call it waste or byproduct goes into another part of the economy. So, mm-hmm. for example, I think one of the big new industries going forward will be the service industry, and I don't mean sort of hospitality, but I mean the repair industry. So, all those yes. clothes that we don't use anymore, all those things, and it's that renew, renewing and reusing of things that we think we don't need anymore, or don't have a, an idea of what we want to use them for. But actually, it's just that lack of creativity or skill 
to, to, to rehouse them and to find them. So um, the circular economy is just basically all about um, making sure that all our industries and all our products that we're ever creating is well thought out with all the side effects taken care of, all connecting. There's this great example in America where uh, they have a community, uh, like a hub of businesses, and they only let another business join if the byproduct of that business will uh, positively affect someone else's business. So you have this community of businesses all interacting with each other. Rather than what we've Fantastic. got at the moment is this like linear feeling yeah. business where you, know, you have the concept of I buy a product, it comes into my shop, it goes out and it goes in the bin or you know that whole thing. Drawing yeah. the circle around is how nature sees it. Really interesting. I, I spend quite a bit of time in Kenya and as a developing country, which has you know, far fewer resources in many ways than, than a lot of the Western communities. And the reusing of everything is just astonishing. The ingenuity, you know, a, a, sing, a simple plastic bottle, for example, there's no way that it would get thrown away. It would be cut in half, that the, the cap kept on, you know, one half of it. They would both be used as plant containers and, and propagators. And, you know, there's, there's always another use for something that would otherwise be considered perhaps rubbish. Definitely. I, I totally see that. I think it's a great new uh, movement. I mean, I walked past the street the other day and I saw some flowers growing out of a Wellington boot and just thought, you know, obviously someone Brilliant. got a charity shop, Wellington boot, and thought, why not? Flower pop. Yeah. Yeah, reuse it. Absolutely fantastic. So in terms of um, moving out of the kitchen and into other areas of life, which I know is something that you're also keen to talk about, you know, going into, you know, things like the, the bathroom, for example. I mean, do you, we have endless gadgets and, and, and products. Is that about then making them more energy efficient, more sustainable? So, yeah, energy efficient and sustainable. So it, it's a bit like how I see the food is that I buy really good organic vegetables. That means that it already has this amazing flavor, and because it's fresh, that's heightened, freshness equals flavor, which means I don't need to use as much of it. Now, I, mm -hmm. I, my life sort of changed a little bit. I've got this product that I use. Uh, it's called Herb Pharmacy. Um, they make mm. grow their own uh, herbs and botanicals to make their own creams. They're an organic English product. It's beautiful. It's delicious. It's, you know, well, not delicious, but it's, you know, it's amazing. Great. I started using it, yeah. and I thought, okay, uh -huh. a bit expensive, but we'll see how we get on. Because it's such good quality, it lasts me twice as long as I would have done or three times as long than a cheap product. So yeah. in terms yeah. of economic value, it's actually cheaper for me in the long run and my skin is better and I feel better mm -hmm. because of it. And I don't need to use other products because it's such a good product. So it's, yeah. it's like that concept of vegetables, but we, we grow better, cook better and live better. So more is mm -hmm. less in that sense. Um, and and you feel good, I think, for it. And there's a lot to be said, I think, for feeling positive. And you used a word earlier, actually, which I thought was really interesting um, from somebody, you know, with your area of expertise, and that's energy. And that's the energy around food. And I remember talking to another eco chef who was very much into sort of the energetic properties of food. And he would actually go and buy, you know, meat and vegetables and things using dowsing rods. <laughs> <laughs> to douse food for energy and you know was convinced that there was an aura that that came off it i mean it, do, you, do you go that far or is that perhaps just a little bit too woo woo well i don't know i know I'm, I'm sort of down with all that i mean you know i, I, I started <laughs> as an organic wine company we looked into biodynamics yeah. and biodynamics is all about burying cow horns isn't it with, with, with cow dung under the soil and but it's it's yeah. about that you know that i guess that sort of hippiness side is actually understanding maybe what the science hasn't revealed yet, but the science is now revealing yep. it. I, I read a great fact the other day that we, you know, we only see 1% of all frequencies, as in there are 99% more frequencies in the world that we don't see. So there must be so much more energy that we don't, you know, yeah. we can feel it through other senses, but there must be so much more that we don't understand. And a lot of, a lot of that is, is about slowing down. I know the, the slow food movement is all about that that if you actually take time to stop and listen and appreciate and value, you perhaps do become more tuned into these energetic frequencies or, you know, for, for, for want of a better expression. Yeah, no, I think you're totally right. I think um, mediocrity drives mediocrity. If we keep pushing mediocrity forward as, a, as this level, 
then we'll all just live in a society that sort of drives this sort of numbness in a way. So I think we've all got to reach higher to that enlightenment of finding that something that's above our own five senses. And that is the energy around yes. us, I think. I think there is definitely that. I think there is something big and deeper and spiritual about that. As you say, if you slow down, you can really tap into. Yeah. I was interested in what you were saying about biodynamic winemaking, and which is, as far as I'm aware, it involves growing vines according to the phases of the moon and, as you say, burying animal horns under vines. And I read a study not that long ago which analysed this from, a sort of, I guess, a more scientific perspective, showing that actually the microbiome of the soil and the microbes that are attracted to this horn that was buried under a plant actually is so full of microbial life that's then supporting the vine. And so do you think it could be that science actually finds perhaps more rational ways of explaining what perhaps more ancient cultures would have just seen as being a more spiritual thing? Yeah, I, I think we are, the science is evolving so quickly in the last 10, 15, 20 years that it is finally catching up to probably, as you say, what are um, thousands and thousands of years before the, you know, the people who have been on Earth have just been tuned into, whether it's through the silence of their own, you know, souls listening to sort of the energies of the world or whatever. But um, you, I, I think you're totally right on that. You know, the microbiome is such a, an amazing um, study that, you know, that, sh that shows, you know, Dr. Mark Hyman's always talking about, you know, how we're all connected and the soil microbiome is affecting our own microbiome and the gut health. And that is all linked. It suddenly reveals that everything's connected. And that's what's so exciting. And quantum physics is proving that at the moment, just how connected we all are, not just on a on a Newtonian matter level, but on this higher energy level, which is, I think, super, super exciting um, because, uh, you know, I, I love this guy called Joe Dispenza. Have you heard of him, Dr. Joe Dispenza? I don't know him, no. Who is he? He's a, he's a guy who's sort of... Um, uh, he had a bike accident and got paralyzed and then through the thought through, through his own thought and power of his mind recovered from it and he's just investigated for, just spent the rest of his life investigating into brain power brain creativity and 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 meditation and it's just amazing you know his the way he laid things out it's just amazing to sort of understand how much energy we have inside of us um that's not yes. released because we're too focused in maybe the material world so does that influence the way you run your kitchen? Do you, do you work in, in, in a more energetic and holistic way? Because I have to say, chefs' kitchens are not necessarily known first and foremost for their spirituality and energetic wavelengths. I'm not going to say we all sit down, meditate and do yoga before we start service. Maybe we should, I don't know. Maybe a great way of doing it. <laughs> I think when I'm in the kitchen, I really try and sort of sh show like the chefs and people who come into the kitchen that sort of holisticness of why it's so important to be focusing on how the food is grown and that so my my, my my cousin's got this great quote she says we're a third our grandparents a third our parents and a third ourselves and i love that because it sort of connects us to it means we're not just us we are because of our parents and our grandparents and our ancestors and i love the idea mm. that food isn't just the food that's created by the chef it's more than that it's created by the farmer which is in the soil which is created by the bugs and the beetles and the microbiome and that we all belong to something greater so i do i do try and sort of teach that sort of holisticness of the food that we create power of that really is coming from the farmers and the suppliers and i bet it tastes even more delicious <laughs> Can we talk a little bit about the things that you're using in the kitchen and the, in, in your recipes? What's your approach to eating meat, for example? So the pubs in Wiltshire, it's, um, it's a very meat-eating area sort of thing. If we were to go a vegetarian, vegan pub, I think I'd probably close down within three months. You know, I have <laughs> thought about it. <laughs> First vegetarian, vegan pub. No. Um, uh, great PR, but probably wouldn't, that wouldn't work. Um, so, you know, I think... Meat as a whole has a, all animals have a relevant part in regenerative agriculture, and as long sure. as we have that con the realization, the connection as to why they're part of the ecosystem, then they are relevant, and therefore there is an ability to eat meat when we're part of that permaculture, ag regenerative agriculture system. There are lots of amazing farms who are farming regeneratively and successfully, yeah. and increasing 
their biodiversity and, as you were saying, the microbiome in the, in the soil. Absolutely. I think, you know, particularly for those of you who are, who are listening in the UK, you know, the UK is predominantly pasture and, you know, you need the ruminant animals to, to fertilise the soil, to, to maintain the soil health, to maintain biodiversity, to keep the topsoil integral and, and that whole life cycle, which is much bigger, isn't it, than just producing one single thing. And, and I guess the key is, is that word you use, regenerative, regenerative ag agriculture as opposed to kind of commercial, industrial, intensive. It is. It, to be honest, it is very hard to find truly good regenerative beef or, 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 or um, pork or, or lamb or anything like that. Um, the, the, the concept is so wide in that sense. You know, I think uh, George Monbiot, Mombio has a sort of, you know, he's renowned for being a vegan sort of thing and an activist for not eating meat. Um, and he's got such relevant parts, you know, such relevant stories to how he tells things. But how can I say to someone in Mongolia or somewhere, somewhere else in part of the world not to eat meat, whereas it's so part of their culture and, their, and, and their, yeah. who they are as a, as a person and what the land can give them? How can I say to a farmer, stop growing animals when they know their land best, perhaps? Um, mm. I think the regenerative agriculture really it, it is harder work, which is why it's probably not catching on as, as quickly, because it is just easier to buy corn, maize from Brazil and feed our cows than it is to actually really work the land and make the whole thing yeah. um, incredibly biodiverse and, and regenerative. But but in the same way with, with food and cooking for me, I think once farmers get into that cycle, as we were talking about wavelengths earlier, energy. The whole thing becomes much easier. The mm. produce becomes better, and um, and the way the farm works just becomes much more succinct. Mm. Do you think customers are becoming more aware of it? Do you get asked questions about provenance of food and, and where it's come from? I'm I'm always annoying uh, chefs and, and waiters and things by saying, "So that looks really interesting on your menu. You know, where did that come from? <laughs> you know, where where was it grown? Who who were the farmers that were producing that?" Yeah, I think the more questions we ask waiters and front of house staff and bar staff and, and chefs, it, you know, we have to supply, you know, supply equals demand, or demand equals supply. Mm. You know, we've, we've got to keep asking where things are coming from and whether they're regenerative, whether they're organic. Um, there's no mm. actual certification on regenerative at the moment, whereas there is on organic. Um, and again, which is the whole organic thing. It's talking about what you know chemicals are going into the animals or not, and I think that's really important because we're sort of beginning to learn how chemicals are affecting our own gut and pesticides and yeah. um, uh, you know the ones we use on grass as well. I can't remember the names of that, but how that's beginning yeah. to affect our own gut um, and the chemicals yeah. and the hormones we use on animals. So it's not just in the interest of the planet; it's in the interest of ourselves as well that we do this. And I think that's what's really exciting about this revolution is that when we realize that we are all connected in this way, that, you know, we can't, we, everything we do to the planet has to be good for it to be good back to us as well. Yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm, I've talked quite a lot in the past about the use of antibiotics, routine use of antibiotics, particularly with, you know, poultry farming. And, you know, that's rising the uh, incidence of, of superbugs and antibiotic resistance. And I think we tend to forget that it's not just what we eat, but it's what we eat, what they have eaten uh, that is is very much a part of it, isn't it? It's like, you know, your your hen's egg is only really going to be as nutritious and as good for you as, as the food that the chicken has eaten to create the egg. And where the soil has come from that's grown the food sure. to create the egg. And so the whole thing's completely linked. And I think that's what's exciting is that when we get into this movement, you just... Every, it's like a train track. And that's why I call it a revolution because it's not just like Oliver Cromwell bring down society, that sort of thing, you know, the government. Although it might, that might be good, I don't know. But um, that, <laughs> that, um, um, it, it's, it's a revolution like in physics because it's, it's like a wheel and you're just rotating the wheel the opposite direction. So we've been going down yeah. one direction for 40, 50 years and we're just going, you know what? I don't really like that anymore. We're going to go complete opposite direction. And I think it's almost mm. as simple as that, just going the opposite way and everything will click back into place again. Yeah, interesting. Can you tell us a little bit more about your latest 30 food project? Because that sounds really interesting. Oh, right. Okay, well, um, which, sorry, which one is that? <laughs> There's, is, it, is it where, you, where you're where you eating 30 foods? Yeah, oh, right. Okay, so the 30 foods movement for me is about three principles. It's, it's zero waste, 
organic and seasonal, and then live mm-hmm. off 30 miles. Um, and I should, right. So within 30 miles, so everything that you eat has to be within 30 miles. I, well, in the books, I actually say 50% within 30 miles. Okay. And so the idea is that obviously living completely within 30 miles is such a high you know, ideology and achievement. I mean, you wouldn't be able to have coffee or chocolate <laughs> or sugar, or maybe you would if you've got, you know, an incredibly, you know, I mean, there's large this, there's this hotel in, run um, greenhouse. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> there's this hotel in Somerset, which is growing coffee. Um, in biodynamically, they've just spent millions on it. So, um, Amazing. You know, so, yeah, so there's that if you want to go to that. Um, but, yeah, no, 50%, because I think for me, it's about really honing in on, like, what our 30 miles is doing. And if mm-hmm. we think about our 30 miles, you know, if we make our own 30 miles better, then the way we live will be more attractive and more joyful. You know, the roads will be better. The farms around us will be better. The, the walks will be better. The the, the clean yeah. air will be cleaner. You know, even if I live in a city, if I start thinking about how the city is breathing or the town is breathing, then I'm going to be improving my own life by buying better produce. Um, mm. so, so it's about this big concept, which is thinking globally. But actually, really, the, the big difference is in the small things that we do, and that's thinking locally. So connect globally, yeah. think locally. And I think, you know, from, from my point of view, you know, I, I live down in the West Country and, you know, I'm very connected to, you know, big farming community. And I think during the pandemic, especially during the early part of the pandemic, we became so much more aware, don't you think, of things like food security? Because deliveries and, and overseas supplies dried up almost overnight. I mean, we had, you know, shortages in supermarkets of all sorts of out of season goods that like strawberries that we're used to seeing just all year round on the shelves. And so I think for many people, it was a little bit of a wake up that we do have all these amazing local food producers, but you've got to use them or lose them. Because if, if that disappears, where is our future food security as a society? Yeah, I mean, that 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 sort of first, you know, lockdown was incredibly scary in many ways, wasn't it? And I think it really sort of um, was revealing, revealing in so many ways. I think everyone really enjoyed the silence, all those who were allowed to enjoy the yeah. silence. Um, those that weren't homeschooling. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, not so much silence, perhaps. But yeah, the, I mean, that the, there was. I mean, that the, the planes were not, you know, so frequently in the sky and the roads were quieter and, and there was definitely a, a sense of almost national taking of stock. And maybe do you think that could be a, a little bit of a, of a tool for, for galvanizing us into the future and thinking, well, you know, if we are back on track now, how do we want to restart this and refresh? Totally. I mean, the, 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 the lockdown gave me such an amazing amount of silence and clarity to be able to see my business and see how I wanted to change that. And yeah, and that silence. Yeah, so totally. I spent the first three, four months of the lockdown just doing wood fire pizzas for the community. You know, selling them locally to the community, and um, it's how we sort of kept our business going really through those initial stages. So what yeah. was amazing about the wood fire pizza oven is that it's completely silent. You know, compared to these big three phase ovens that I normally use in the kitchen, and I was like, wow. So I've got this huge amount of energy over here with the wood fired oven, and I've got this big three phase oven over here. Why am I using this one over here when I've got the wood-fired oven on all the time for the pub for making pizzas? So yeah. after the first lockdown, I just got rid of it. Uh, you know, I sold it, moved it on really? a floor. Let's just cook everything through the wood-fired oven and completely change the concept. And now, you know, the meat and the fish and the cheeses and the vegetables, they're so much more tasty because of energy, because of the wood-fired taste. So That's so interesting. So I imagine that we won't find a microwave in your kitchen then. No, 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 no microwave, I'm afraid. No, none of those radiation energies, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah, people do talk about that, don't they? About, you know, kind of the negative energy then and the radiation that's going into food. Yeah. Or at um, least kind of stripping out a, a lot of the nutritional value, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, keeping things as simple as possible to the to, to a true, as truest form as possible, you know, to create mm-hmm. the most amount of nutrition. And deliciousness, I think. You know, I think that the hard part is done in the field, um, rather than you know, and then and then the rest of it is just like you know, not screwing it up for the you know for the customer. Yeah, and and the next generation for for sure. So apart from kind of switching off and or, or perhaps not not buying the microwave, what would your other you know potentially more extreme or, or left of field suggestions be for those wanting to be a bit more sustainable in this space? Uh, cook, like cooking or living or, or all of them 
all of them wherever, wherever you want to go with it yeah <laughs> um so um yeah so i think you know if we look at those three concepts the the, the zero waste the organic and seasonal and the live your 30 miles if you take each one individually they're incredibly it can be incredibly hard and it can be incredibly mm. expensive you know if we buy organic vegetables from the supermarket that might, may seem expensive and there's also lots of packaging involved so, yes there is so so and, and and ironically there's lots of packaging because it has to be labeled organic um which is annoying <laughs> yes. isn't it right so 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 um and i i also have this thing that time degrades flavor or transport degrades flavor so the less connected or the further away the vegetable is from the land it will degrade the flavor and the nutrition and the energy so part of this supermarket and this is why the lockdown was interesting because the supermarkets they do they do do a great job of fueling the country with energy and with you know food but what it highlighted was is that it's such an inefficient system i think personally i think it's an incredibly energy consuming system economically it seems to be working because it's that linear way of thinking but in terms of actual energy i don't think it works at all so time and transport degrades flavor and nutrition so but if you combine all three concepts at the same time zero waste you know cooking zero waste buying it from an organic supplier locally to you getting it delivered in a in a, in a, in a, in a sort of cardboard box or whatever that's when food really makes a difference and I think yeah. really deep down we need a, a, a logistics revolution to make that work for us on a sort of modern level um, but also on a day-to-day -day level. Yeah and one of the joys of, of going on holiday overseas particularly to countries like France and Italy and Spain is that they have such extraordinary market yeah. culture and they will shop locally for very fresh fruit and veg you know that day or every other day brought in by the farmer that morning yeah. fresh from the field literally and you know that there's no question is there that the food does taste sensational and I'm sure it's not just because we're, we're full of sun and sangria I'm sure there isn't an actual real taste taste benefit there as well I don't know I think you know if you're down and stuff, if eating, <laughs> not that I'm knocking sun and sangria yeah, mussels and rosé I don't know <laughs> or you could be in Cornwall haven't you a cider and mussels but it tastes better because you're yeah. in the environment of which is growing and all those energies are connected, you know, yes. the muscles and the sea air and the sun and the Cornish people, you know, that's when the whole thing works. It's like a, yeah. a piece of art that just says the same thing, doesn't it? So is that a real challenge then for city dwellers compared to country folk? Uh, yeah, I mean, it is. I mean, it's, it's definitely harder because we're trying to redevelop what we've kind of... I mean, but I've got this great guy called um, Duncan Baker-Brown. He's an architect based in, in Brighton super sustainable he's been talking about it for years and he has this phrase called mining the anthropocene as in the sort of the area mining the what anthropocene what is that so the anthropocene is that is this era that we're this you know um ge geological era that we're in at the moment um uh -huh. and so we're in the anthropocene at the moment and he says we're mining it so we've already extracted so much out of the earth what we need to be doing now, because he's in construction, he says, let's not keep mining out of the planet, but actually let's just mine what we've already mined. So as in, let's right. reuse products, let's reuse uh, materials, and he creates yeah. buildings completely out of waste projects. For that of, um, they've got a product product on at the moment where they're making a building out of like lobster shells and crab shells and oyster shells, um, which is amazing. Wow. So... I love that concept that we've already extracted so much out of the earth. Let's see what we can turn that yeah. into. I mean, there's this great fact that um, I think there's more gold in iPhones than there are, you know, fourth fingers on on, on, on women today sort of thing. As in, as in if you wanted to, to buy a ring for your wife or whoever, your partner, then, yeah. um, uh, then, then, then you can extract it from an iPhone because there's enough gold in the planet to do that already. That is just extraordinary, isn't it? So rather than digging down, we should just be looking out. And I guess people are doing that, aren't they? Making fabrics out of recycled plastics and, you know, different, uh, yeah. you know, reusing, as you say, you know, using crab and lobster shells and finding different ways of doing it, making packaging out of cornstarch from the husks that get thrown away, perhaps from food waste. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, have you heard of a product called Tencel? 
Yes, and that's a tree fibre, is it? It is, exactly. So it's not necessarily reusing, but it is a new product that's been created that we now use to create clothes. Yeah. Obviously, that's amazing because we're growing trees and plants, which is absorbing carbon dioxide, growing more oxygen. Yeah, so then we're planting more and it, and it becomes... I mean, of, of a bigger benefit, I guess, isn't it? Yeah, I, I'm sort of trying to coin this phrase called moral renaissance. And um, it's sort of looking back that the renaissance period was so creative, you know, so highly innovative and um, imaginative and creative in that sense. Mm. We need to go back in. We are in this era again of creation and innovation. But this time around, we've got this huge moral moral code and ethical code to sort of send us on the right track. I mean, you're you're a lot younger than me, and you know, a, a different generation. And I do sense this with my children, you know, who are in their twenties and and late teens, that there is this morality, and they've even been sort of nicknamed the young Victorians because they are taking, you know, just like the, a lot of the Victorians, you know, have sort of, you know, managed to abolish slavery and become very aware of 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 you know really serious issues that were around them and that were prevalent at the time. Do you think that do you see that amongst your peer groups that the questions that your generation are asking about food and provenance and sustainability are really front of mind, perhaps where it possibly wouldn't have been much of my vocabulary? I mean, I'm I'm in my fifties, and words like sustainability and eco and you know is are all relatively new to me. I've always sort of ironically said, I, or, you know, jokingly said that I'd love to have set up a restaurant in the nineties because I would have just. If it feels like it just would have been cool, you know, like I just put steak and, you know, poivre sauce or whatever, San Pellegrino and all this amazing wine. And you just just love cooking yeah. cool restaurants like that. You know, it's like the Caprice in London because yeah. I didn't have to think about all these other things. But sure. But, but, but really, and this is what's exciting about it, is that when you dive into the thinking about other things, that's when life gets more flavoursome. That's when you come up with things like the sweet corn cob ice cream or... Um, mm -hmm. Another one that we've got at the moment, which is um, plum kernel uh, creme brulee. So, wow, um, how do you make that? So, uh, inside a Victorian plum, I choose a Victorian a Victoria plum only because they're bigger. Uh, but you've got the stone, mm -hmm. and then inside the stone, you've got these two tiny little kernels, and they're, they're absolutely tiny, but they have this amazing almondy marzipan flavour. Um, so you, you you sort of roast them. You crush them up and then put them through your milk and cream mixture uh, with your eggs and whatever to make the creme brulee, sugar. Um, blitz it, sieve it, and then cook your creme brulee in a bain marie, um, and then they're done. You know, and then you cool them down, sugar on top, low torch or grill, whatever you want to do. And when we did the, the yeah. photo shoot actually for the for the book, we got this amazing French chef called Valerie, and she said it was genuinely the most uh, delicious creme brulee she's ever had in her life. That is high praise. Is high praise. Oh, it my goodness. It's not about the recipe. It's more about the fact that the yeah. flavour comes from something so small that is a byproduct. Yes. I mean, just extraordinary. Yes, yeah, something that would have ended up, you know, in, in the bin or, you know, hopefully at least on the compost heap. I think there's this great expression, isn't there, which is necessity is the mother of invention. And I know that sometimes when I've been cooking and certainly during lockdown, when I was doing IGTV lives and I was cooking in my kitchen and I just couldn't get certain things, you know, those supermarkets ran out of flour and, you, you know, a recipe would call for some strange ingredient, which I just didn't have. And we just had to become a little bit more creative. It was almost like the wartime era where you started, you know, having things like egg substitutes and all sorts of things that people couldn't get hold of. And yet when you start to think outside of the box, perhaps, you come up with all sorts of super interesting things that are potentially better, as well as being more sustainable. Yeah, as you say, um, uh, you know, um, necessity is the mother of invention, isn't it? You know, I think I was walking I around so. town the other day and um, uh, I needed a barbecue. And uh, so I live in Hastings and it's just got this amazing amount of uh, sort of, I'd say bric-a-brac antique shops. Um, Mm. But I went into one sort of thing and, and there's this sort of, I was with a friend and he said, you know, I'm looking for a barbecue. And I, and I said, well, there's one over there. And it was just a rusty bowl. But it was a big bowl, you know, sort of beautiful metal bowl sort of thing. And he goes, no, we're not going to use that as a barbecue. I said, no, no, we'll, we'll get it. It was £12. Brought it back, put it on top of a, a planter, a metal veg planter, put it on top mm. and got the grill out of the, you know, out of the oven and laid that on top of the two hoops that were already there. And suddenly you got this perfect barbecue. It's just like, you know, Things are there, yeah. 
and it's just sort of yeah. maybe using that bit of creativity. And I, I, I really believe, and I, I go along with Ken Robinson in this, so Ken Robinson, and just talk about how much creativity needs to be pushed through schools again, you know, and really how much, yes. for me, how sustainability is the core of my business. I think creativity should be at the core of education as well. A lot of those things seem to have been born out of hardship in a way and deprivation. Do you think that perhaps we're living, you know, or previously have been living in, in a too much of a cushioned and easy society where we don't challenge ourselves to be creative and to find alternatives? Yeah, I think I think you're probably right. You know, I, I love a good um, uh, um, music biopic, you know, looking into these amazing megastars who have created their lives, you know, you know, someone like Ray, you know, or... or um, uh, you know, whoever it is. I mean, Helen Ruddy is the latest one, wasn't it? And you just see that people come from nowhere, don't they? Because they have to push themselves to something. Yeah. And I think that whole movement yeah. from post-war, whether it was, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, all that music was so good. And the 80s music, because it was really pushing ourselves because it was in an era which was um, hard, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. So what do we do? We create things that are beautiful or magical to sort of to counterbalance that. So perhaps, you know, I'm, I'm going to jokingly say Spice Girls, I, you know, we all love Spice Girls, but maybe they weren't the pinnacle of great music. They were the pinnacle, you know, of what they were for, for, for you know, women rights and everything. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, maybe the 90s wasn't such a great music era, for example, because we had yeah. a lot of luxury. Yeah, absolutely right. Did you grow up, talking about luxury, did you grow up in a farming environment? Because your parents have a farm next to your pub, is that right? Yeah, so we weren't we weren't there when I was growing up, but um, mum had mum always grew vegetables. So even though I was a generation mm. that was brought up on chicken kievs and fish fingers and, and you know, <laughs> everything else that Jamie Oliver tried to get rid of. Boo. No, I'm joking. Um, he, he, we always had great vegetables. Um, and that was such a, an important thing of us because I think... Um, Again, it had that connection. We used to go out and pick the raspberries and strawberries. And yeah. My grandparents always grew vegetables as well. I remember my granddad's tomato greenhouse and just that smell of the greenhouse and the tomatoes mm -hmm. and the vines. I've got a recipe in the book, actually, which is um, tomato leaf focaccia. And Tell me about that. Well, so, so tomato leaf, people say it's part of the, um, it is part of the nightshade family, but it's not the deadly nightshade family. So I wanted to use them because obviously we get so many leaves on the tomato plant. I want to try and capture that essence of that smell. So I've had recipes before where um, you simmer the vines in the stock and then you set it to make this beautiful jelly. And I've had that before, it's delicious. But anyway, I use the vines almost like a herb and I soak them in hot water to extract all that sort of vine flavor and then mm -hmm. use that water to make the bread. And then the vines uh, cut up through the bread as well. So it has a very really? sort of tomatoey leaf flavour without the tomatoes. That's really interesting. Have you made bread for a long time, or was it something that you took up, presumably not just in lockdown, but it's been for you. It's been a staple, has it, for a while? I love making bread. We so we got the pizza oven at the pub. We love making the dough there. You know, it's such an incredible science. And I've got this big thing called, you know, it's complexity within simplicity, and. That whole thing about sourdough, isn't it? Is that that big revolution or whatever? But it's the complexity within the simplicity simplicity of it. It's just flour mm. and water and some yeast, but yet you create all these amazing flavors out of something because of the the energy and the slowness of which you give to the technique and the development of the flavors. So that whole processed movement of creating refined foods, you know, is just it's killing all the biodiversity. It's killing all the diversity of flavor and what we're trying to do is actually take one beautiful flavor ingredient develop it in such a beautiful way and then create more flavor than, than we have done before you are making me so hungry just even thinking about it and you are so right actually when you talk about the flavor of a, a sourdough pizza base you just can't beat it can you and it's more easily digestible so i mean it's a it's a double win it is a double win isn't it i mean i mean you're making your own yogurt i mean do you, do you make yogurt Oh yeah, I'm a big fan of that. Yeah, and it's one of those processes, isn't it? You just do it once a month, you know, every morning or every couple. Of easy, easy. Uh, usually, usually a Sunday afternoon, and it's so so easy. 
And it's so sustainable. And I, I first got into it because I was fed up with throwing, throwing away all the little plastic single use yogurt pots. Yeah. You know, there's only so many seedlings you can prick out in your yogurt pots. And uh, so I just, you know, started making it. And it's just such a joy to fact, you know, to know that there's no plastic in the fridge. It's all just in reusable glass containers and I'm fortunate where I am, I, I can buy milk from a, a local dairy vending machine oh, wow. in reusable glass bottles. And that's such a way ahead, I think. I'd love to see that, you know, being brought into towns and having milk vending machines. Yeah, I think you're totally right. That's amazing. There's this, because um, I don't know because it's, it's coming out at the moment, but black currant leaves. Have you ever used those in, mm. in cooking? So, yeah. So No, what do you do with a black currant leaf? So, <laughs> so the uh, black currant leaf has this amazing flavour of black currants. So again, like really? making yogurt, when you're heating your yogurt up to temperature, just simmer the black currant leaves in there and then let it cool, you know, rest, cool down and put it in the fridge and it'll have this amazing black currant flavour without the black I am so going to do that. That is that is genius. And do you think if I chopped up a bit of sweet corn kernel, I could make a vanilla-y flavoured yogurt as well? Absolutely. Great idea. Yeah. Delicious. It's, it's yeah, it's going to be a great a gastro for the next book. Exactly. I'll, I'll, I'll give you that one. Um, it's going to be a gastro kind of culinary project and hopefully one that we can get the youngsters engaged with as well because I think they can experiment and become these sort of little gastro mini gastro scientists and yeah uh, there's just so many lessons aren't there to be learned whether it's foodie and or microbiome or regenerative agriculture or sustainability or you know or planetary awareness whatever you're talking about biodiversity you, you're just ticking lots of boxes aren't you basically yeah definitely I think so a bit like this whole circular economy thing Ken Robinson talked about circular education and it's mm -hmm. not subject-led but it's project-led he has this great example where he sort of says um instead of let's let's teach our our kids about the French Revolution but during that lesson let's also make a guillotine and then let's speak French as well whoops dangerous <laughs> well yeah maybe not a guillotine but you know like <laughs> let's do a risk assessment first shall we <laughs> cardboard guillotine um <laughs> cardboard, cardboard guillotine. Guillotine. and then and, and dress up as well you know so you're making clothes out of uh -huh. reused products uh, and then you're speaking mm -hmm. french as well because and then it's a holistic way of teaching kids about a project rather than going right everyone sit down let's let's speak french and i did french, french and spanish and for some reason you know it was fine i enjoyed it but i, I couldn't get there because all i wanted to be was in spain speaking spanish to a spanish person um you know, trying to order a beer and just talking about stuff, real life. So when you're discussing yeah. politics in your oral exam in Spanish, it just doesn't seem very exhilarating at the time, does it? But um, yeah. so I think this idea of project-led education uh, is, is definitely the way forward for me. I love it. I love it, Ollie. We're going to have to get you on the national curriculum for sure. <laughs> It has been great to talk to you. Huge success with your book. Have you got another one in the pipeline now? Uh, I have thought with, with all these ideas. It's just spilling out of you. They're great. <laughs> well, the next one, I think, in theory, is um, it's called the, um, the Green Revolution. And I would like it to be about mm -hmm. our soils, our societies and our souls. Um, so Soil, society and... Soul. Uh, soul. Yeah. Brilliant. And how what we were talking Brilliant. about, the holistic energy, just how the same way of thinking captures all three of them. Are you tempted to get some dowsing rods out now? <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. What, what are, I don't know. What are dowsing rods? Sorry, I'm going to play dumb on you. Oh, my goodness. Dowsing rods. So you say, look it up online. You have these two, I think they're copper rods, and they used to douse for water. Oh, yes. And when you walk over water, then the rods cross and you kind of have to tune your energies into them. I'm probably explaining this really badly and there'll be professional dowsers out there who will be, you know, shouting at this podcast. But that's essentially, I think, what it is. And you get people who douse auras and douse for energy over food to see just what what the energy is coming off something or a person or a thing or a land mass where water might be. And that apparently travels up through us and the person who's tuned into the dowsing rods and makes the, the rods move through the energy. So I've, I've seen it in action. I've, I've, I've seen a, a chef dowsing, dowsing frozen chickens to see which ones were, were produced ethically. So make of that what you will. Well, that's cool. <laughs> I'll be looking for some dowsing rods soon then. 
<laughs> watch this space. Oli, it's lovely to chat to you. Thank you so much. I do feel truly energised by our conversation. I hope that everybody who's been listening to us does too. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me on your show. Well, that is it for today's episode. Huge thanks to Ollie, super inspiring. And as always, you will find the links and the resources for the things that we mentioned over on thisaltwellbeing.com. And there you can also sign up for our free weekly newsletter filled with weekly sustainable tips for living well and perhaps slightly greener too. Huge thanks to all of you who are leaving us such lovely reviews and comments, especially on iTunes. It really does help others to find the show. So sincere thanks. And until the next time, go well. Bye-bye. The Liz Earle Wellbeing Show is presented by me, Liz Earle, with production by Amaryllis Earle and Harry Trevithick at Heart Dialogue. With grateful thanks to my producer, Ellie Smith, assistant researcher, Martha Comerford, and guest booker, Millie de la Morinière.